Hello my friends, welcome to my corner. This video is a continuation of the video that I did on Feliberto Hernández. I wanted to give you an overview of this great author's work, but I also wanted to focus on one of them, and I chose the Daisy dolls. This to me is one of his most perfect uh, stories. It is uncanny, it is eerie, it is creepy, it is disturbing, it is dark, and I really really enjoy reading it the many times that I have read it. It was every single time an absolute pleasure. So for biographical information I'm going to refer you to that other video that I did on the works of Feliberto Hernández. With this one we're just going to go straight to the point, so let's explore the world of Las Hortensias or the Daisy Dolls. This was published as a book, this story by itself, in 1949 in Spanish, and in English, you can find it in the collection Piano Stories, which was published in 1993 in a translation by Luis Haras. However, you can also find it in this great collection right here that I found at my local library, right? This is titled Masterworks of Latin American Short Fiction, Eight Novellas. Listen to the authors that you can find in this collection. We have Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Ana Lidia Vega, Guillermo Cabrera Infante, Álvaro Mutis, Alejo Carpentier, Julio Cortázar, Joao Guimaraes Josa, and then finally, last but not least, our friend Feliberto Hernández. So, what genre are we talking about? Let's start with that. We are talking, of course, about the novella. We're looking at 40 to 50 pages. In my Spanish edition of Feliberto, it is exactly the same length, and the story is divided into 10 uh, very brief chapters. The original title of the story, Las Hortensias, actually means the hydrangeas. But the problem there is that in English, hydrangea is not really a name. I mean, it could be a name, right? Because you can just use anything as a name, but it doesn't really sound very good. So that's why we have in English the title, The Daisy Dolls, so that we can play with the name right there. Different flower, same unforgettable story. So the situation here, we have a couple at the center of the story. We have Horace and Mary. The names have been translated in the English version. Okay, it's Horacio and Maria. And they live in what they call a black house. Okay, they refer to it as the black house. This house is surrounded by a garden, and right next to the house we have a factory. Look at that interesting setting that we have here, right? Um, Horace likes to collect dolls, okay? That is his pastime. And the dolls that he collects are just a little bit taller than the average woman. Every now and then, every other day or something like that, a group of men come to the house and they arrange these dolls with captions and with music so that they make up these scenes that Horacio and his wife Maria can enjoy. I'm going to read you one of the captions just to give you an idea of what these scenes depict, right? So in the first scene that we find, this is the caption. So the guy opens a drawer, right? Finds the caption there and the caption reads, a moment before marrying the man she doesn't love, she locks herself up wearing the dress she was to have worn to her wedding with the man she loved who is gone forever and poisons herself. She dies with her eyes open and no one has come in yet to shut them. So that is one of the scenes that Horacio and Maria like to enjoy. And here's an interesting thing. Maria likes to joke with the dolls. So what she does is she sets them up in unexpected or unusual places for Horacio to find them. Horacio actually becomes, you know, so obsessed with the dolls that he sometimes mistakes them for Maria and vice versa. Okay, so it's like at one point he approaches Maria, he's about to say something to her, and he realizes that it's not really Maria, it's one of the dolls. There's a turning point in his life. At one moment, Horacio knocks one of the dolls over, and in his mind, he interprets that as an omen, as a message, maybe, that Maria is going to die. So it is at that point that he buys the doll Hortensia, or Daisy, in the English version, because he wants really a replacement for Maria. So notice how dark uh, this really is. Now at first Maria has no problem with these dolls, okay? She develops a connection with them just like Horacio does. The three of them go for walks together and then they also begin to sleep in the same bed, you know? So it gets really weird at, at that point and it gets much worse after that. And basically what we have here is that the doll constitutes the connection between Maria and Horacio, okay? So they, they communicate through the dolls. It's like they don't really have a direct connection with each other, which is something that, you know, you don't want to be in that situation. When you love somebody, when you're with somebody, you want to connect with them directly. They need to connect 
through these dolls at this point. So it's definitely there's something wrong with this marriage. Now there is something here that I wanted to point out. There's a little thing that is lost in translation. Okay, Maria's name is actually Hortensia Maria. So the equivalent would be Daisy Mary, right? So what happens is that after they purchase the doll, Maria becomes, Hortensia Maria becomes just Maria, right? So basically she loses her name to one of the dolls. And then there's another interesting connection, and it's this one. Horacio and Hortensia in the Spanish edition, the two names begin with the same three letters, right? So I'm going to let you explore that, but just be aware that there is something there that is lost in the translation. Eventually, Maria becomes jealous of the doll. Okay, and this is completely understandable. I mean, if you have been replaced by a doll, or if there's a doll there that's going to replace you after you die, and this guy is thinking that she's going to die, it's only natural that she would develop this kind of jealousy. And there's one point in specific where Horacio asks one of his friends to try to make the dolls more human-like. Specifically, what he wants is the dolls to have human warmth. The, the concept of warmth is actually mentioned, and that is what makes Maria kind of go really, really jealous. I'm going to read you another little quote here so that um, we can illustrate that idea of the warmth and also of the connection between them that I was mentioning before. This is the way chapter 2 ends. Although it was spring, the night turned cold. Mary refilled Daisy, dressed her in a silk nightie, and took her to bed with them like a hot water bottle. As he dropped off to sleep, Horace felt himself sinking into a warm pond where all their legs tangled like the roots of trees planted so close together he was too lazy to find out which ones belonged to him. So it's a scene where they're actually sleeping in the same bed with the doll and the way to make these dolls warmer or more human-like is actually, as, as the text says, to uh, use them almost like a, like a warm, like a hot water bottle. You fill them with hot water and they become more human-like. So things get more complicated after that. There are more dolls that are included in the story. And also the couple separates, they start to live apart. And that's where, you know, things begin to deteriorate. So I want to explore some themes of Las Hortensias or the Daisy dolls. This is really a story about obsession, I would say even a story about fetishism, right? And a story of madness also, and this becomes apparent from the very beginning of the story, but also, you know, progressively it deteriorates towards the end. Above all, I would say the main theme of the story is that of desire. So for that reason, I connect the story to Kafka, right? And just like in Kafka, you have those twin elements of guilt and shame. That is also something that you find here in the Daisy Dolls. Horace really is constantly hearing the noise of the factory. So that's a leitmotif that we also have, right? And through that, I would say that the story is a commentary or maybe a reflection of the fear of modernity, of the fear of industrialization that was present at that time in, in Latin America. There's another interesting leitmotif that you find in the Daisy Dolls, which is uh, Horace's horror of mirrors. It's almost vampirical, you know, it, it makes you think of Dracula. So there are some elements that you could say are a little bit in, in a gothic vein in this story right here. And then the scenes in which the dolls are set up, right, these, these plays, right, that where you find the dolls, also made me think of just the concept of storytelling, because the guys who come to the house arrange these dolls to tell a story. It's a static story, they don't move, but you still have a story there through the captions. So, literature, of course, but also the cinema, right? Because remember that one of uh, Feliberto's jobs was to play the piano at the cinema back when the movies were silent. So, there's another connection there to that type of uh, storytelling. Now, another major theme that this story features, and here I try to save the best for last, or the most interesting for last, has to do with the objectification of women. Okay, I'm going to quote you another little part of this so that we can illustrate that concept right there. This is Horace's reaction to the scenes. Okay, every time that he sees one of these scenes, this is what he's feeling, and he, these, these are his, his words, right? He's trying to explain this to other people. So he says, when I look at a scene, it's like catching a woman in the act of remembering an important moment in her life. A bit, if you'll forgive the expression, as if I were opening a crack in her skull. When I get hold of the memory, it's like stealing one of her undergarments. I can use it to imagine the most intimate things, and I might even say it feels like a defilement. In a way, it's as if the memory were in a dead person, and I were picking a corpse. 
hoping the memory will stir in it. He let his voice trail off, not daring to describe the weird stirring he had seen. So even that silence at the end, you know, he doesn't dare to describe this. That is typical of Horacio and just the dark undercurrents that are going on in this story. There's a point in the story in which Horace's friend also starts to make his own Daisy dolls. He opens a business, basically, selling these dolls. And to me, that is a commentary also, maybe a criticism on consumerism, right? Or maybe just a commercialization. Remember that this is also tied to the factory. We have that factory there in the background, and Horace constantly feels or hears the noise from the factory. And then we have this idea of manufacturing, right? Manufacturing the dolls. So there's the connection to that factory right there. It's very interesting because as the dolls become more human-like, the human beings become more mechanical or more doll-like. So that is a play that you're going to find here in this novella. Now, towards the end, things just get progressively grotesque, okay? And then it is that fragmentation, in this case in particular dismemberment, becomes a very prominent theme in the novella. So that is something to look out for as you read the Daisy Dolls. I also wanted to explore some connections with other authors. Of course, I mentioned Kafka before. I would say that Felix Berto is kind of like an Uruguayan Kafka, but a little bit more subtle than, than Kafka. Okay? And if you read him, you're going to see what I mean. He's not as, um, as extreme as Kafka can be in some cases. There's also that connection with Gothic literature that we mentioned before through the um, reference to Dracula, maybe with these mirrors and all of that. But because of the theme and because of the situation that we have here, probably the most obvious connection would be with E.T.A. Hoffman, and in particular with his short story or novella, The Sandman. Okay, which is the one that Freud used as a basis for his theory of Das Unheimliche, or The Uncanny. It's a famous essay by Freud that, you know, I welcome you to read as you explore this novella because it really will give you an added dimension to the text that we are looking at. But as I read the story, I kept thinking of one artist. Uh, you have probably seen his grotesque dolls. I am talking of Hans Belma. So uh, you can look them up if you have, are not familiar with his work, but he was also obsessed with dolls. And those that's kind of like what, the way that I imagined Feliberto's dolls to be as I read the story. I would also say that in a sense, because we have this idea of uh, the woman that is not real and the man falling in love with this image, right, that he idealizes, in a way you could say that the Daisy Dolls is a rewriting of the myth of Pygmalion. So there's that element there too. And above all, okay, as I read the story, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, I wish this particular filmmaker had adapted this to film. Do you know who I'm thinking of? I'm thinking about Luis Buñuel. I think he would have been the perfect filmmaker to adapt the Daisy Dolls to a movie. And now that I remember, I think there's one film by him. I believe it's The Criminal Life of Archivaldo de la Cruz. I may be mistaken, but I think it's that one that features a mannequin. So. Maybe there's a little connection right there with Luis Buñuel. I think one of the reasons why this work, uh, The Daisy Dolls, really resonates with us is because it has to do with one of our deepest obsessions, and, and this is for sure a male obsession. I am talking about the obsession with the mechanical woman or the doll. And if you think about all the movies that have been produced with this, you know, from Blade Runner to Ex Machina, and even some silly movies like Mannequin, or Lars and the Real Girl, you know, silly movies, but that nevertheless, you know, explore some deep truths and some, you know, very interesting comments on the human psyche and all of that. There are so many movies that deal with mechanical women or women that cannot be grasped, you know, women who are not entirely human. In the realm of Argentine cinema, because that is kind of my area of specialization, I kept thinking of the films of Jorge Polaco. He's a very interesting filmmaker. His movies are not perfect, are, they are quite imperfect as a matter of fact, but he was also interested in dolls. These are very dark movies, okay, and especially as I read the Daisy Dolls, I was thinking about his second feature film, which is titled En el Nombre del Hijo, so In the Name of the Son. And it's about a man, a middle-aged man who lives with his mother, very, very creepy relationship between them, okay? It's like really Freudian, like Oedipal and all of that. And his job is to restore dolls. So that's what I thought about. Jorge Polaco would have been a, a very good filmmaker to maybe adapt um, the Daisy Dolls. Though he was not very interested, I would say, in uh, storytelling, in traditional 
structures uh, for, for storytelling, so I don't know how that would have worked, but it would have been an interesting result in any case. Bottom line, I would say that Felix Berto really hit on a really deep theme that is just embedded into our psyche with the Daisy Dolls, and that is what makes the story so powerful. I would say that Las Hortensias is really one of the most enigmatic, one of the most memorable, and one of the most stirring novellas that have been produced in the Spanish language. I like about this one the fact that, unlike much of his other work, this one has just a unity of vision, right, a clarity to it, that is not present in his other works, and I think that is what makes it a masterpiece. I don't think he edited the story more than his usual story or anything like that. It just seems to have been written under a trance, like much of Kafka. So you have also that other connection there in uh, the way that the story is written, maybe. We have no way of knowing this, you know, but we know that Kafka, some of his stories, he wrote them almost under a trance. And that is what I feel when I read something like Las Hortensias, that maybe Felix Berto was working under that type of inspiration, uh, for want of a better term, you know. So I really like that, and I feel that that really translates to the reader. So I would say, my friend, just read it. Okay, just uh, just explore this text. Um, you know, don't think twice. It's all right. <laughs> I, I think you're gonna love it. And if you don't, you can tell me. Okay, Jorge, you're crazy. This is not really a good novella. But for my money, this is one of the best novellas to come out of the Americas. You know, and in the Spanish language. So when I encountered it for the first time in a college course, I was fascinated by it. And every subsequent reading after that has just been has just added to my experience of this great text by Feliberto Hernández. So those are my two cents on Las Hortensias or the Daisy Dolls. I hope you enjoyed the video and I do hope that it does justice to the text. Do you have any questions, comments, recommendations, recipes? You know where to find me. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.